not receive the news that I posted on the church Facebook page. I have a very special treat for everyone starting this evening. From now on, Sunday nights, we will be conducting a PowerPoint along with the lesson when we go live on our Facebook. And for those who don't have Facebook accounts, you can be able to still watch the sermon after I upload it on our YouTube channel. You'll be able to access it on our YouTube channel, and I'll be sure to let everyone know when it's uploaded. And then, so I'm very excited. I always love PowerPoints because they give a good visualization. It's a great and helpful tool uh, to help others to be able to follow along with the lesson and to be able to visualize uh, the points and the discussion of what we'll be uh, talking about. So tonight we'll begin with that and possibly, hopefully, I may be able to have those PowerPoints uh, set up for our Wednesday night class as well, but uh, we'll just have to wait and see. I may have it on some Wednesday <clears throat> nights and other nights, Wednesday nights, I may not have it. And then so my schedule is very, very busy, as everyone is familiar and very uh, aware of. So uh, I'm very excited to get that started. And so the handouts uh, for tonight are also on the podium back there. So be sure to grab one if you are wanting to access and join us for tonight's lesson at 6 o'clock live on our Facebook channel. In the past, and even I would say today still, Christians have made something of an issue about the way people spoke about the church. They are always very careful in regards to the choice of words that they use in regards to the church. They always make sure to never say, my church or our church, because it's the church that belongs to Christ, which is <clears throat> right. We all are very aware that the church that Jesus built within the New Testament is the church that belongs to him. Which is why on our sign that we have there, it says, of Christ, of expressing ownership, Christ owns the church. He's the head of the church. It is his. We also are very aware to make sure that we don't refer to this building as the church because the building is not the church. We, the members, baptized believers, we are the ones who make up the church of Jesus Christ. We are the church. And the building is just the building. So we always make sure, even within our choice of words, uh, that uh, we say that I'm not going to church, I'm going to worship. Yes, I'm not going to church because we are the church, but instead I am going to worship. The church we rightly recognize belongs to Christ and is always his church. And we did not and do not want to say anything that would cloud that great truth. But also, I've come to realize that more recently, many within our brotherhood, specifically those who teach at our Christian universities, have greatly misspoken about the church regarding its kingdom aspect. Many of our brothers that teach at these universities also even teach behind pulpits in front of congregations, declaring that the church is not the kingdom and the kingdom has not yet come. They'll say that in Matthew chapter 6 in regards to the model prayer. They'd say that it's still okay to use the words, thy kingdom come, because it's not yet here. Well, we're going to focus this morning in regards to understanding what the kingdom is, and we will prove from the text that the kingdom is here. The kingdom is already here. The church and the kingdom are one and the same. That is going to be our main idea in this morning's lesson, is to show and to prove and to share, even with others, that the church and the kingdom are one and the same. And our main text that we're going to focus on this morning comes from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 19. Now, I'll also encourage everybody to go ahead and have your markers ready because we're going to focus on a second passage. So there's going to be technically two main passages that are going to want uh, us to focus our attention upon. And the first one I want us to see is in Matthew chapter 16, 
And once you're there, again, please have a marker that's there ready to mark it before we move to the next passage of Scripture. But in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 19. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon of Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven who has revealed it to you. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So he tells Peter two things of what he's going to do. I will build my church, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom. The kingdom. Point number one from our discussion of this text is that in regards to this kingdom, this kingdom has been spoken of in times past. And I want us to look at the prophecy foretold, number one. The prophecy foretold about the kingdom. This prophecy that is foretold now takes us hundreds and hundreds of years in the past in Daniel chapter 2. So if you have your markers, hopefully you had them ready, mark Matthew 16 and turn back with me over to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. It's right after the major prophet of Ezekiel in the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 2. Here within this prophecy that's foretold about the kingdom that Daniel gives, it is also within this prophecy that is foretold, he is going to unfold history. It's a prophecy that unfolds history. When you look at verse 31, beginning at verse 31 of Daniel chapter 2, Daniel is speaking with the king of Babylon at the time. So at this point, Babylon, God's people of Israel, are in captivity with Babylon. Daniel is within captivity of Babylon, but he is known to be the advisor of the king. He is the king's right-hand man, and he is there to help him interpret these dreams and these visions and these messages that are being given to him. And after having a very peculiar dream, beginning at verse 31, Daniel tells him of what this dream is, what it means. He says, You saw, O king, verse 31, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And came like the shape of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, so that not a trace of them could be found, but the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. What Daniel interprets this dream to be, through inspiration, being guided by God, he unfolds what is known to be history. It is an unfolding of history. Nebuchadnezzar, a Babylonian king, had a dream which troubled and perplexed him. In his dream, he saw a huge statue of extraordinary splendor. 
This dream, which Nebuchadnezzar had and Daniel interpreted, is one of the greatest prophecies in the Old Testament about God's kingdom. Look at verse 44 of Daniel 2. He says, And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms, and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. It seems very interesting because this kingdom that God will establish, a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, was a kingdom that was cut out of the stone, that was not made by hands, and it came and it crushed the statue into millions and millions of pieces, obliterated it completely. Significant facts and details regarding God's kingdom are found within this text right here. It is also a prophecy which we must carefully consider if one is to have a clear understanding of what God is doing in the world today. So when he unfolds the history by interpreting this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in regards to God's kingdom, he also declares of the time of its establishment. That's the second detail I want us to look at this prophecy when it's being foretold, is the time of its establishment. In verse 44, Daniel says, In the days of those kings. Well, what kings? What kings, what kings are he talking about? Well, in context, it's during, the king, it's during the days of the kings of the fourth kingdom that God would establish his kingdom. So it's in the days of those kings of the fourth kingdom God is going to come and establish his kingdom. The four body parts that we read in verse 31 through 35, the four body parts and colors along with it, each represent a worldly kingdom. If you look at verse 32, he says the head of this image, so first body part is the head. The head of this image was a fine gold. Well, he later tells in verse 36 or 38 that this head of fine gold represents the Babylonian kingdom. Look at verse 36 through 38. He says, this was the dream. Now we will tell the king his interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them. You are the head of gold. So he's talking to King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian kingdom. You, your rule, your kingdom is the head of gold. And what's interesting is that the city of Babylon in ancient times was referred to as the golden city. Isaiah chapter 14 verse 4. Babylon, the Babylonian kingdom, was known to be so luxurious of all its fine gold. Many of their temples, many of their buildings, the whole palace of King Nebuchadnezzar was made of fine gold. They loved gold. So what better else to describe the kingdom than the color gold? Right now, he reigns as being the head, the kingdom, the rule. He says, right now, you are the gold. You are the kingdom. So that is the first kingdom, the first body part, the head. It represents the Babylonian Empire. And then when you look at verse 32, he says, its chest and arms were of silver. So the second body part is the chest and the arms, made of the color of silver. Well... Now when you look over at verse, uh, yeah, verse 39, he says, Another kingdom inf inferior to you shall rise after you. So this other kingdom, the second kingdom that's going to rise after King ba uh, Babylon is going to be the chest, the arms, the silver. This kingdom would end up being the Medo persian Empire. The Medo Persian Empire. So the Persians are going to come and they're going to infiltrate Babylon and they're going to destroy the, Babylon, uh, the Babylonian kingdom and then they're going to reign as supreme. This happened during Daniel's time. 
Daniel was alive when he witnessed the destruction and the fall of Babylon. When you look over at chapter 9, verse 1, we see that he ends up serving under the Persian king. Look at chapter 9, verse 1. He then says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent of Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Chaldeans was another term used to represent the, Babylon, the Babylonians. He reigned supreme. So Daniel was alive during the transitioning from the power of the Babylonian kingdom to the power of the Medo-Persian Empire. And the Medo-Persian Empire was known for the silver ornaments that would be worn by the soldiers of the empire. So they represented the chest and the arms, the silver. The third body part, he says the bronze, middle, and thighs. Verse 32, going back to chapter 2 of Daniel. Verse 32, he says, it's middle and thighs of bronze. And then in verse 39, he says, after the second kingdom conquers you, O Nebuchadnezzar, he says, there will be yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. This bronze thighs, or this middle section, uh, right here, will represent the Grecian Empire of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great would lead his Greeks, his soldiers, who would wear bronze armor. They would wear bronze armor. And historically speaking, we see that Alexander the Great, he conquers the Persian Empire. And it thus became the Grecian Empire from the year 333 B.C. to 663 B.C. The bronze and middles would represent the Grecian Empire of Alexander the Great. And then lastly, he says there's going to be the last body part, the leggings, the feet that are of iron and clay. He says its legs, verse 33, of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Look what he says in verse 40 and 41 about this fourth kingdom. He says, there shall be a fourth kingdom strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. This fourth kingdom would be the kingdom that would conquer the Grecian Empire. And folks, that is none other than the Roman Empire itself that reigned from 63 B.C. to 475 A.D. Check, check on it historically. It all falls into place there. This fourth kingdom would be so powerful, so powerful and strong like iron. Nothing would be able to, to break it to pieces. And folks, when you look at the conquering of the Roman Empire through history, they conquered almost half of the entire world. Almost half. They were a major, ruthless powerful empire so strong like iron but what's going to be the downfall it's going to be the part when it mixes with clay it will become a divided kingdom and historically speaking we see that the roman empire ends up later on becoming a divided kingdom in regards to its clients of kings they end up separating its kingdom due to the clients of kings which would eventually lead to the downfall of its demise. Some would even suggest that this uh, divided kingdom may have been referred to when it went from the Roman Empire to the Holy Roman Empire, when Catholicism came in. Because that was just shortly before it was destroyed in 475 AD. But again, not enough evidence to prove that. But there is much evidence to show that its division came when they divided, when they divided it of client kings. So this leg of irons 
mixed with clay would represent the Roman Empire of Julius Caesar in which Roman emperors would wear crowns that were made of iron. So after Daniel described, so we have the four kingdoms. Again, I'll summarize it. Kingdom number one, the head of gold, Babylonian Empire. The chest and arms of silver would represent the Medo Persian Empire. Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, throughout the end of the book as well. Number three, the thighs of bronze of the armor would represent the Grecian Empire led by Alexander the Great. And kingdom number four, the iron mixed with clay will be none other than the Roman Empire, led by the Roman emperors. After Daniel had described the four kingdoms made with hands, that is, with physical power and physical might, physical military might, he then described a fifth kingdom that would be made without hands, that would be established by God during the kings, during the days of the kings of the fourth kingdom. Fourth kingdom being the Roman Empire. During that time, this kingdom that God will set up, kingdom made without hands. He said that this kingdom, earlier in verse 28 of chapter 2, is going to be a kingdom that's going to be established in the last days. He says, But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. The latter days. It will be revealed and established in the latter days or the last days. New Testament writers identified the latter or the last days to be known as the Christian age. The New Testament age. Which would include the time of the Roman Empire. Acts chapter 2 verse 16 and 17. And Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. It was during the time of the Roman Empire, Jesus had built on Daniel's teaching, announcing that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom is at hand. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. The establishment of the kingdom about which Daniel had prophesied was, in fact, so close at hand that Jesus even said that some of the bystanders who were there with him would not die until they had first see the kingdom come with power. Mark chapter 9, verse 1. Mark chapter 9, verse 1 is the verse that completely destroys the false idea that Jesus would not establish his kingdom until he returns. Well, Jesus said that some of the bystanders in Mark 9, verse 1 would not taste death, will not die until they see the kingdom come with power. So are you telling me that these same bystanders are now over 2,000 years old? That doesn't sound right. No. They were going to be there when the kingdom was established. So exactly when was that kingdom established? After understanding the prophecy that was foretold, we can now have a better understanding of what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 through 19. So back to our main text of Matthew 16, verse 16 through 19. After looking at the prophecy being foretold by Daniel, Matthew 16, verse 16 through 19 is now going to discuss the promise that came to its fulfillment. He's going to talk about the promise that will be fulfilled. He says in verse 18, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Part of this promise that he now gives to Peter in regards to the church and the kingdom, he says that this church, this kingdom, is going to be built on a solid foundation. A solid foundation. Specifically, what was the rock or solid foundation on which the church and the kingdom was built? Well, what's interesting here is that in verse 18, Jesus is using in the Greek language what's known to be as a play on of words. He refers to Peter in the Greek, which means Petros, to be identified as a little rock, a little rock or a little stone. About the size of one that you can just hold in your hand. 
is the ordinary word for rock that you can just easily hold in your hand and just be able to toss on the ground. But the Greek word that he uses for rock in Matthew 18 is Petra. And this word refers to a rock that is massive. The kind of rock mass that cities would use as their foundations. Guess where Jesus was when he was speaking this? Verse 13, Caesarea Philippi. Guess what Caesarea Philippi is built on? A rock mass foundation. A rock mass foundation. And Jesus, using the city that they're in, says that, like Caesarea Philippi, my church, my kingdom is going to be built on a solid rock mass foundation. So when Jesus says, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, he is making a play on of words, saying that, Peter, you are a little rock, but on this massive rock I will build my church. Okay, that we understand. But still, specifically, what is that massive rock that he's talking about? Well, you have to look at the context, folks. When Jesus asked the question, but who do you say that I am? Peter correctly answers, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You know what the phrase, Son of, means? Well, it's a Hebraic expression. An expression from the Hebrew language, which literally means... The partaking of the nature of. I say that I'm Corey, the son of Keith, means that I partake of the nature of Keith, my dad. And for those who have met my dad who came here um, a few weeks ago, many of you have told me saying, y'all look just alike, you can be twins. Even when my wife met my dad for the first time, she didn't believe me that he was my dad. She thought that he was my twin brother because she's like, y'all walk the same, y'all talk the same, y'all even chew your food the same. Okay, so what is the point here when he says that you are the son of the living God? You are partaking of the nature of God. What is Peter confessing here? The divinity of Jesus. He is confessing the divinity of Jesus. This confession tells you about the person of Jesus. He is God, fully divine. Peter's confession on the deity of Jesus and his divinity was a massive, rock-solid truth of who Jesus was. The solid foundation on which Jesus would build his church was the rock of his own divinity. That is a foundation that will stand forever against the test of time. It was so powerful, so strong, and so solid that it was also seen to be an indestructible foundation. So indestructible that Jesus says, the gates of hell shall not even be able to prevail against it. Other versions may have the word Hades. Hades seems to be the better translation of the word. But Hades literally means the unseen. It refers to the unseen realm of where the souls would gather and wait for the final judgment. They've already received their individual judgment upon death, but then they wait there for the final judgment. And the gate that is referred here would seem to be the gate in regards to this physical death in the world. The gate to this world is physical death, so Jesus says that nothing can overpower the church, not even death itself. Not even death itself. Satan used death to try to defeat Jesus, to try to prevent the establishment of the church by killing him. Well, guess what? Jesus' death and his resurrection ended up being our means of salvation. He lost. Satan lost. Jesus won. You can't stop the church. You can't stop Jesus. So, therefore, seeing that Satan has lost, he then is going to try to destroy the continuation of the church by killing off the members. Well, in actuality, guess what, folks? If every member of the church, of the Lord's one true church, worldwide were killed, the church would still be alive. Well, how do you know that? Well, 
Because the seed of the kingdom is the word of God, Luke chapter 8, verse 11. As long as the word of God exists, when it is read by men with honest hearts, the seed is implanted in those hearts. And when the seed comes to fruition, obedience results, and people are added to the church. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, verse 41, and verse 42 and 47. Now do you see what Daniel meant when he prophesied God will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed? Not even death itself can be able to stop it. This is what sadly many within our brotherhood at times especially those who have been led away by Catholicism. I've had a member, well, I refer to him now as an erring brother, because he has strayed away. He was a great example for me in my hometown congregation that I grew up in. Sadly, several years ago, I heard that he left the church and went to Catholicism. I was like, What? I couldn't believe my ears because he was so sound. I'm like, what happened? Well, I was able to actually sit with him. And I wanted to hear his side of it, of why he went. And the only argument that he said is that throughout history books, there's the big kicker right there. Throughout history books, all that we see during this time is the Roman Catholic Church. I don't read anything in history books about the one true church, the Church of Christ. Well, then you understand that those who are in power are the ones who write the history books. Who was in power at that time? The Holy Roman Empire. So whatever the Holy Roman Empire said, whatever the Pope said, it went. And whatever the Pope didn't like to hear, they deemed as false and heretics. So what's interesting is that many of the individuals that we read about that were deemed as heretics were probably actually members of the church. We read about the Council of Augustine who brought forth the false teaching of original sin, meaning that babies are born sinful, that they inherit sin, which is false. But then we read about him having a debate with a strange man by the name of Pelagius, who in the debate was declaring that no, every person is responsible for their own sins when people are held accountable for their actions. The age of accountability is when they are determined to be, when they can understand right from wrong, is when they are responsible for their sins. They're not responsible for the day that they are born. We don't inherit Adam's sin. We inherit the consequences of his actions, but not his sin. And Pelagius, in the debate, when you read about it, was the only one who was quoting scripture. But yet, the big pope found what Augustine found to be more intriguing. And so he deemed Augustine's false teaching as truth and deemed Pelagius as false and a heretic, even though Pelagius was preaching the truth. And yet some indications of who this man was seemed to be a member of the church. Where did he come from? Well, we don't read about the one true church in history books written by men who are in power. Why? Because they were have to go back into hiding against Catholicism. The church still existed, and even if all the members of the church at that time were dead, it still existed. Why? Because the word existed. The seed is the word of God. As long as it exists, the church will always stand forever. The church and the kingdom that God set up is a kingdom that cannot and will never be destroyed. So with that being said, exactly what was that day? Of its establishment. You discussed so many things leading up to this point, Corey, but now what when was that day? What day was it? Well, look at verse 18 and 19 of Matthew 16. He says, I tell you, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. I will, future tense, build my church. Verse 19, I will, future tense, give you the keys of the kingdom. When Jesus made this promise in Matthew 16, 18, and 19, the church kingdom was only at hand, but not yet established. 
But if the church had not begun yet, when did it begin? Well, it still wasn't established in Acts chapter 1. Because in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, Peter asks Christ, before he was ascended, about the kingdom. He says, Not yet, but remain in Jerusalem. For when you are empowered by the Spirit that will come, then you will know. Well, by the time we get to Acts chapter 5, verse 11, we find that the church was in existence. For there it reads in Acts 5, verse 11, And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Okay, so now we know that it had to have existed sometime between Acts 1 and Acts chapter 5, verse 11. Well, in Acts chapter 11, Verse 15, Peter explains to the church in, in Jerusalem how the Gentiles also received the Holy Spirit. He says, and as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just like it did to us. Here's the key phrase, in the beginning. Well, what beginning was that? When did the Holy Spirit fall on the apostles? It came upon the apostles when we get to Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, on the day of Pentecost. Folks, that was when the church, the kingdom, became established. Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost, that was the day, that was the beginning of the church and of the kingdom. Peter was given the unique privilege of using those keys to unlock the door and to open the door of the kingdom to both Jews, Acts 2, and to the Gentiles, Acts chapter 2. 10 and 11. Peter was given the honor of being the first to preach the terms of entrance into the kingdom. For the very end of verse 19 of Matthew 16, he says, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The Greek text literally translate this as whatever you bind on earth has already been bound in heaven. That's how it says it in the Greek. Whatever you bind on earth has already been bound in heaven. Okay, well, what does that mean? It means that Peter's message would first be bound in heaven and then be bound on earth. In other words, it indicates that when Peter would preach, he would do so by divine inspiration. The terms of entrance into the kingdom and to the church are terms that were originated by God in heaven. Peter was not speaking about terms and conditions from his own opinion, but from God through divine inspiration. What were the terms and the conditions of entering the kingdom, the church? Well, the terms and conditions were given to those who believed for when Peter stated in verse 38 of Acts chapter two, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Folks, those are terms and conditions directly from God in heaven who has made it bound, saying that this, are the, this is the terms and entrance of being able to get into the church and of the kingdom. Is by faith, repentance, and baptism. We read that Christians in the first century who obeyed these conditions have been transferred into the kingdom of Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. So, how can they be transferred into the kingdom if the kingdom, you say, has not already come yet? Does not make any sense at all. Those who are waiting for God's promised kingdom to be established on earth when Jesus comes again... Wait in vain, because the kingdom is already here. It is here. It is the church. And furthermore, to add on to that, Jesus, Paul, tells us through inspiration that when Jesus does come again, and after all things are said and done, after the dead in Christ are raised first and those who are left alive in Christ rise up to meet him in the air, and after the final judgment is made, when it's all said and done, Paul says that Jesus is going to return the kingdom 
back to the Father. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23 and 24. So how could Jesus be able to return something back to the Father when you say that it has not been established yet? That does not make any sense whatsoever. Folks, the kingdom is here and it's established and it was established on the day of Pentecost. The days of those kings during the time of the Roman emperors of the Roman Empire, the fourth kingdom, God established a kingdom that can never be destroyed and it is the church. I want to be a citizen of that kingdom that Jesus established when he built the church on the day of Pentecost. Do you? The church and the kingdom are one and the same. We focused on the prophecy foretold by Daniel, and we looked at the promise being fulfilled by Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 16 through 19. Among all those churches which exist today, which one will you be a member of? Personally, I want to be a member of the church that Jesus built. Do you? you not. Again, those conditions that were bound in heaven are still bound on earth. Upon entrance of hearing God's word and believing from hearing God's word, Romans 10, 17, to repent and turn away your sins and by confessing that Jesus is the Lord, master, and ruler of your life and to put him on through baptism of your sins washed away, you will enter the kingdom of God. You will be added to the church. And fo folks, for us as citizens who have been transferred into the kingdom of Christ, it's our duty, our duty, to remain faithful citizens of that kingdom. For when we fall short, make a mistake, and sin, we can be able to confess to him that he is faithful and just enough to forgive us of all unrighteousness, and the blood will continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you are subject to the invitation or if you have any need, I encourage you, please come forward together as we stand and as we sing. Bring Christ your broken life, so mar thy sin.